Welcome back to Hour 3 on Friday. It is our hour where we do preparedness, civil defense, space weather, earth changes, uh, even things like geoengineering the earth uh, uh, for weather modification and its dangers. We talk about all kinds of things and we have our panel, John Moore and Ann Morrison. And via John, I have referral of Bob, who's a pilot, international pilot, who uh, will remain anonymous otherwise, but I'm sure there are Bobs on every planet in our solar system and galaxy, so that's not a problem. And Bob's going to give us his take after we hear get a, just a quick, you know, 30-second minute blurb on the topics Anne's going to cover. She's got some pretty hot topics here. And, of course, uh, I don't know, John, are you there? I'm here. You know? I'm here. I'm maybe, here. You, maybe you want to do the intro on, uh, on Bob because you referred him uh, to come on the program. Right. And then we'll hear from, <clears throat> from Anne for a minute. And then we want Bob to discuss all of his issues he wants to convey. All right. Tell us about Bob, uh, John. What... How do you contact him? What does he want to say? Uh, get, you know, just the broad, broad brushes because he has his own. Uh, he has. He'll have the stage here in a moment. Okay. Are we on the air? Yes, we are. In, yeah. Oh, okay. On well, fantastic. Thank you, Doctor. Well, Bob is a commercial airline pilot. Uh, he contacted me uh, the other day uh, after he wrote an, an article, a short letter on Steve Quayle's website. He's been uh, informing friends and family for years. He. He wants to have a larger outreach with the highly, highly privileged information he has access to. Since he is mm -hmm. a commercial airline pilot and he's up there five, six miles high uh, looking down at us and making observations that very few people, and I mean very few out of 350 million, have the opportunity to do. And then he has the expertise as a commercial airline pilot to understand things that other people can't understand. So he brings a lot to the table uh, and uh, I think his input's going to be very valuable to help us understand from first-hand observations uh, as opposed to looking at the internet, uh, first-hand observations of some of these matters, and I'm really looking forward to working with him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, why don't you just give like a 30-second promo what you'll be talking about later. Um, we have a couple of hot issues today that are going on, especially the with John mentioning the issues of what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, what do you have today that we're going to talk about later? Well, we have a very important um, notice coming out, an alert coming out from the USGS about Mount St. Helens. They are measuring a rising magma within Mount St. Helens, and I think we've mentioned that we've had harmonic earthquakes under Mount St. Helens and Mount Hood, and also um, on the way to Yellowstone, and we've had harmonic vibrations at Yellowstone, and then also down the Cascade Range into California. Yeah, and by the way, every 350 to 500 years, there's a, they call it the, uh, I think they call it the, uh, the war bird or whatever, the, the natives call it this, this war dance. And uh, last time it happened, I think it was about 400 years ago, there was a major subduction fault line zone movement that literally disappeared in a, a entire forest under the Cascadia Range off the coast of Oregon. And a tsunami was, I think, five or 600 feet high. It was just unbelievably enormous. Uh, people need to realize that the earthquakes move in a clockwise direction around the, around the ring of fire and uh, were due for not only the Alaskan earthquakes but also earthquakes in the Cascadia of Subduction Zone and along the New Madrid Fault System and along, along the California Fault System and we've already had some warnings of those coming. So we'll get into that a little later. Um, uh, I have a, another paper I'm going to pop on later on in the second and uh, the, the third or fourth segments that's pretty shocking but it's important. Um, Let's get started with Bob. Bob, tell us all about your story. Uh, what do you want to convey to the public, and where do you see the dangers of this technology, um, either for flights, for climate, for the population? What's going on? Um, I was made aware of the possibility of geoengineering, popularly called uh, chemtrails, which is sort of corrupts the discussion, but geoengineering. Initially, uh, it was brought to my attention by a family member, and I dismissed it like most airline pilots do. And I continued to receive questions, so I began researching it, looked into the subject, read, read papers, books, and listened to, to uh, videos, and I became interested. Then I began to make my own observations and realized that there appeared to be some contrails that were not standard contrails. With that said, there are standard contrails that do linger that are thick, depending upon the air mass and the temperature of the air mass. Uh, but I began to notice or 
recognize the pattern of a geoengineering contrail, and I became absolutely convinced when uh, I was taking a walk in the woods with my wife when I saw a four-engine transport leaving a very heavy contrail at approximately 10,000 feet. Jets don't make contrails at 10,000 feet. Right. And I went, my gosh. <laughs> so then the next morning I saw a mist floating down around in, in the woods, and I thought, well, what was that? And then, it, then within a day or two, I had some respiratory distress. So I became aware of this issue and, and continued to study and, uh, and make observations and then spoke with some people that I work with uh, that experienced the same uh, issue. And so then I started noticing in my weather packets very unusual weather patterns, specifically, I would say, the last perhaps four years, where there would right. be four or five pressure, low-pressure zones along a front, which is very unusual. And in some cases, the jet stream flowing in a direction which was not really natural, which would have had to have been engineered. So I was also aware of the possibility of these uh, geoengineering contrails uh, directing weather, perhaps being used to uh, obscure the sky, perhaps being used to absorb radiation, which is what the barium does. Right. Strong, strontium, I guess, is a uh, immunosuppressant, and of course, aluminum is, is uh, connected with um, uh, Alzheimer's. Right. Um, so I, um, I began to observe it, and yeah. also I recognized that just prior to Hurricane Sandy, there was extensive geoengineering in front of the Hurricane Sandy, and I thought, uh oh. So it's going to be intensified and steered, and sure enough, it was. Even though it was the wrong time of year, too, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, also, I noticed the same thing before Irene, and or, which is Hurricane Irene, which our area was was um, significantly hit, and, and especially my property. Um, so I began to really worry about this because it was affecting people's lives, communities, families, disrupting people, and I think it's probably a multifaceted reason and purpose for doing this. Um, some of them I'm sure you've mentioned on your show, but uh, uh, Monday, Monday evening I was flying and recognized the unusual nature of the storm in the central Mississippi area. So as I was approaching it, I saw that it was extremely intense, very energetic, constant lighting, which is, which is almost never seen. Right. And there was almost no vapor or uh, most moisture around the storm. So I thought, okay, how can I look at this? So I noticed the, the ram air temperature for the airplane, and I saw a minus 34 degrees approaching the area and a, a sudden uh, increase in temperature to a minus 27. Now, it's very unusual to see that kind of temperature change at altitude. Of course, on the ground, you do see a change in temperature and, and of course, wind across the front. But then the temperature went back down on the uh, eastern side of the front. And I right. also saw all the wind flowing into the low at altitude, which you'd usually see that at, at, um, on the ground or the surface. Right. Uh, so when I got home that night and then looked at uh, my usual uh, website Tuesday morning, I would notice that a uh, uh, man was tracking the harp energy, and that's exactly where I saw the temperature change. Right now, how do you? What's your understanding or information on what, how harp or harp-like technologies are being used to modify the weather? What have you been told or researched and found? Uh, it's basically uh, energy um, focusing on the ionosphere, and then right. beaming and of course, down the to an area to create heat and or move the low pressure zone or high pressure right. zone. Actually, exactly. All of these molecules, by the way, are paramagnetic. And they use plasma interferometry or special infrared lasers to move the storm cells. They're put at 70 to 80,000 feet. That's why they're very high above the regular contrails. Uh -huh. Do you have a break coming? We're coming back. We're now back. Welcome back, and we're back with Bob. I want you to continue on this discussion a bit, Bob, because it's really important. We need to get you back uh, also in future shows because um, 
Yeah, when I combine with the with talking to expert pilots like yourself, and in a sense you're like a uh, meteorologist too, because as a pilot you have to know about the weather and air map systems in order to even know. For example, if you don't know where the tailwinds are at a specific altitude, you don't know if it's going to be a bumpy ride or you're going to be able to get a little headway. But if you start late, etc. Yeah, basically all pilots are in a sense a former meteorologist, isn't that right? Yeah, for the most part, yes. And of course. Um, uh, scientists because we're, we're trained in aerodynamics and, and uh, other issues and physics. Right, so when you hear the physical explanation that I gave for what I have from classified sources and basically, and I've talked to other people that kind of get pieces of this, uh, they kind of chomp around the edges of it and try to make speculation. I know exactly how the system works. And I give exquisite technical detail too because they have first hand knowledge of this taking care of not only the pilots but also uh, working at US Space Command for a period of time and having advanced technical background so I could ask the right questions and I have a photographic memory. So um, then when you fit it in you can start making better observations if you have a model at least to challenge and say well I don't know if I believe Deagle's model but you should be able to do several things. Firstly you should be able to see uh, scalar harmonic frequencies if you have the right type of listening equipment to see them manipulating the upper atmosphere, you should be able to pick up specific harmonic frequencies for those what I call paramagnetic molecules in the upper atmosphere: strontium, uh, uh, sorry, so barium, um, aluminum, and um, uh, uh, it salts up in the upper atmosphere. And when you see those specific frequencies show up, you know that they're moving around storm cells and they're going to do something. Yeah, as I said, uh, you've improved my knowledge base, and now I um, understand the mechanics of what I've been observing. Yeah, it's pretty scary now. I want you to give some projections of what you think this will do to not only pilots, but people, living systems, the benthic layer of the oceans. I mean, where the hell is all this going? I mean, uh, you know, this is not science fiction. This is really happening, and there's maniacs that don't consult the public. It's not representative government running it. It's a form of bizarre, psychotic, globalist maniacs that are just doing it. When they're flying out of Buckley, I spoke to Dr. Isley, who's a physicist, from the Vitamin Cottage, he's an owner there, but he's also the founder of the World Constitution Parliament Association and the Federation of Earth Documents, which all countries on Earth have signed back when they signed it since 1958, where they found it with the United Nations. They've signed it by the mid 80s. Uh, they were the ones primarily pushing for geoengineering the upper atmosphere, and the UN is completely behind this, and they click behind the global governments and what we call the special eight free secret agencies like NSA, no such agency, and all the secret agencies on Earth. Uh, and by the way, it doesn't matter if they're spraying over your country, whether it's China or Russia. When they geoengineer the upper atmosphere, it slides and does what's called laminar equalization, so it spreads to every country on Earth, so they can manipulate the weather anywhere, and they can also use this interferometry field to create earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, and extreme weather patterns that can be very devastating. So uh, this literally weaponizes the planet. I have seen uh, some of the information and videos on the uh, designer of the HARP system where he showed an earthquake could be uh, triggered, and it certainly makes sense to me that if you've got a fault line that's under stress, if you uh, radiate energy at it and cause... I'll, I'll, tell you how it, I'll tell you exactly how it works. Every fault line, just like a, like a wind chime, has a frequency that's a harmonic, and there's subharmonics too. They've mapped out every harmonic and subharmonic of every foot, major minor fault line on Earth like mapping out all the wind chimes. If they want to create an earthquake, what they do is they set up an interferometry field in the ionosphere above an area where they want to create it, and there's a transfer of energy through these harmonic frequencies to the Earth. As that transfer occurs, the energy is built up in the rocks as a piezoelectric slip threshold, and the mu or resistance in the rock face drops to zero, and then you get a release of energy equivalent to the amount of energy you want to release. You pump in a certain amount of energy, you can get a certain amount of slip in the fault zone before the muon resistance increases again. That's how it works, technically. So you can literally create any size earthquake anywhere on Earth, just like the one in China that was done about five years ago. We did that, and we did it to destroy an underground facility in western China that killed 180,000 Chinese, including 90,000 children. Uh, this is what we're doing. People need to get a, a life here and realize that this is not a joke. This is very serious, and they've weaponized the planet now. Uh, no surprise to me. Uh, I want to thank you for filling in the gaps in my knowledge base because now I understand the mechanics of it. Uh, yeah, it's very simple actually. They, they pump in these frequencies and it's not just pumped in by harp. You can actually pump it in through the ground 
Uh, and once you create the right harmonic frequencies, wherever you pump it in, it's going to pick up on those specific fault zones, and you can actually pick up, if you had a detector across the fault zones, a piezoelectric current increase before the earthquake releases. So just like the fault zone detectors here in California, which the universities are putting in, they measure across the fault zone the piezoelectric current. As that current in milliamps uh, increases, uh, you know you're about to have an earthquake. So, wow, they know all this stuff. It's, it's, this is this is technically exactly what they're doing. It's scary as hell. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's unsettling for sure. But to, yeah, what what really so, oh. brought my resolve to, or what really stirred my resolve to bring this to people's attention is to watch towns. Uh, families, neighborhoods destroyed, farms. Right. Well, there's uh, tornadoes. For example, tornado is a plasma event, and they could literally have plasma cannons that knock these tornado uh, plasma events out and we dirt devils out of them. There's, there's no excuse for allowing tornadoes to exist. We have on-the-shelf Warehouse 13 technology to disable all tornadic activity, period. But there's no need for a storm system or hurricane to strike the U.S. or any other coast on Earth, we have technology that actually can turn those out and neutralize them out at sea. <clears throat> so when these things happen, like tornadic event that kills people, it's because they want it to be. And if they want to make an army of these literally twisting tornadoes, they call the dead man walking, we have two or three tornadoes twisting around each other so it looks like a man at a distance walking, like the natives say. Yes. They can do that. They can make a wall of tornadoes, hundreds of them marching across the Midwest. That's what they can do. Certainly reasonable to expect that if weather can be steered, manipulated, and engineered, it can also be stopped. No, no surprise yeah, there. Exactly. There are, there are other organizations, including one based in Canada in Ontario, that actually has stopped a lot of these and doesn't have absolute control, but has stopped a lot of attempts to do some very bad things. So it's not a one-sided story that they have oppressing control. And other uh, countries such as Russia, which are not on side, they have weather modification technology. And I'm sure there's weather, war weather and geotectonic wars happening right now. But again, it's the same thing as mutual assured destruction. Whatever one side can do, Russia can do just as good or better. So if one group tries to pull off something really catastrophic, like setting off the Cumbra Viejo supervolcanic island, sliding into the ocean and creating 800 foot high wall of water heading toward New York City, uh, the Russians can trigger that as well as we can neutralize it. And the problem is that people don't understand these weapons are deployed. I'm so, uh, aware of that story in the Canary Islands. Um, it seems uh, hard for me to imagine 800 foot wave, but I can certainly imagine a 50 foot wave. They've already That's done displacement studies at the University of California here, uh, <clears throat> up in Northern California, as well as the, is the Tsunami Research Center in Switzerland. And I've uh -huh. tracked and presented all the data on that. Um, John, what do you think of these consequences? When we come back, we're going to hear from John Moore. Stay there, Bob. We're going to hear from Ann Morrison, and we're going to have a, a quick pop-in, too, by Tim Alexander with a, a quick report on the exploding civil war now in Ukraine, because the war, the civil war, is on. Russia, I believe, will swoop in in about three days and crush him like a Viking invading band. And Europe and NATO and America will do nothing. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and if you've been boggled, we're going to try to unboggle you. I speak a little too fast, but I'm putting together books that will be coming out this year as e-books. Uh, we have, a, we want to hear Anne's story because it's extremely important. We want to hear a quick update report here from uh, from Tim Alexander, who's ordinarily on Thursdays. Uh, we, we bring him on other times, and he has an emergency report. Uh, tell Tim, tell us what's happening. What, what's going on in Ukraine? Well, you know, Dessa was has been relatively quiet uh, up until the last day or two. Thirty-eight people. Some reports say thirty-one, but it's it's now pretty certain it's probably thirty-eight have been killed in a fire in a building uh, that was the center of clashes. Uh, you basically have uh, armed warfare. In the Ukraine, which yesterday Putin spent most of yesterday warning uh, the coup junta not to do what it's doing today, uh, he's, he's called an emergency session of the UN Security Council. Uh, I said yesterday this was probably going to happen. I'm going out on limb here because Putin is the slickest uh, political operative of our current age, but right. I think he probably is now. 
uh, between a rock and a hard place, and he'll probably now use his military force in Ukraine. Yeah, uh, but but if you're looking at a master surgeon, like a neurosurgeon moving in to take out a tumor and not somebody bleed to death or cone some of the frame and magnum, uh, on a geopolitical and military level, this man does not drink vodka, even though he's Russian, has a very high IQ, has multiple talents, and he will move in there in a military, strategic, and geopolitical manner as a master politician, and it'll be a surgical excision of the so-called coup junta out of Kiev. Uh, and then you'll My see the parties all about to... All the Ukraine. My guess. Yeah, he'll take it all, but, but he'll also... Here's what he'll do, though. He will. I, I predict that he will uh, allow each of these so-called sub-republics to actually vote whether they want to be Russian or they want to be sucked into the IMF and end up with a quarter of their pre previous pensions and have a sturdy fascism. And he'll leave it up to the peoples uh, to vote for that. But each republic will be autonomous and most of it will turn Russian. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. The, here's the fly in the ointment. Uh, the people that have organized this, and uh, you, you could say it's our government, but they don't represent the American people. Uh, they spent $5 billion of our tax dollars to create this nightmare. They right. want a war. Uh, the Israelis want to punish and break apart Russia because uh, Russia uh, under Putin stopped them and the West from attacking Iran. The same story with attacking and invading Syria. Right. But the globalists want this as all part of their new world order endgame. At the very minimum, they intend to get out of this in a total global economic collapse. Uh, right. Nothing is good uh, about what's happening. Right, and by the way, it's and tied it's to geoengineering, and to it's a time to, that we're, the geoengineering of the Earth's climate is primarily going to induce massive global famine, number one, and number two, a massive increase in disease states because ultraviolet light suppresses your immune system. When you geoengineer the atmosphere, you let in tremendous amounts of cosmic background radiation and ultraviolet light and x-rays, gamma nothing rays, and so nightmare from Fukushima. That's basically right. yes, exactly. It was a report. Large, no, enormous numbers of fish, birds, sea lions, whales, porpoises are being spotted off the coast of California. They're trying to get away. Well, what, what they're they, doing is they're going to the coastal waters because there's rain and, and water from creeks and river, rivers that keep it relatively less radioactive. So they literally are trying to escape the literally wall of death moving toward them of longer isotopes that are accumulating. And if it wasn't for the blocking high, and I want to get into this with Bob, but the blocking high out in the North Pacific, and I want you to come back with a follow-up report. Uh, the person who discovered this was Jeff Rance, followed up with some of his, his meteorological buddies, but I'd like you to analyze it because... I, with my radiation detector, have checked the rain here in Southern California, and not one time is ra ra water radioactive. It is it's basically, only the last few days has it gone up even slightly, but all of our rainstorms we have here come from the South Pacific. If you track their weather systems, they come from monsoon rains of the South Pacific. They don't let any weather systems drop rain in North America uh, from uh, Fukushima Daiichi. None. That's telling. It means they don't want a public that wakes up vomiting blood or getting dizzy or unable to eat or can't think straight. They don't want people with acute radiation sickness and they're freaked out that if they don't use their level 10 geoengineering weapons, we'll all get our pitchforks out and start marching on the capitals. But how long can they keep that up successfully? <clears throat> this is not going to last long. And uh, uh, I believe that they want martial law. They want a medical martial law, which is why we have three candidate super plagues that Ann will talk about now that are on their way, and we're on our way to a catastrophe this year and next. And the blood moons are tied to it, but we have Ebola, H7N9, and a resurgent H1N1 flu, and beta coronavirus 2. These four different plagues are probably going to hit us repeatedly in the next year and a half, and there will be medical martial law tied to bank holidays. So there are going to be a devaluation of the currency. There's going to be net neutrality issues. are going to come back up again the Internet. Uh, they, you know, things are going to get ugly. Let's put it that way. I'm really, in my gut, don't think that there's a high probability at this point, unless there's a major change in the government and they impeach Obama, I don't think we're going to have a 2016 election. I may be wrong, but my gut tells me that there's something here wrong. And as they say, there's, there's more than just rotten fish in Denmark. This is, doesn't look good. Uh, and let's give us your, your report, and uh, then we're going to hear from John in the last segment. Thanks a lot, Tim, for that report. That's very important. Yeah. Well, call me, and we'll, do a re we'll report afterward on the live stream channel. We'll do a live stream report as well, and we'll post up that hyperlink so people can see the, the, the video of that discussion. Okay. Okay, very good. After five, uh, bye. Yeah, okay. yeah. and uh, tell us 
what you found because we have all this. No, I want to hear from John and get his opinion, kind of tying it all together because he's the, the geopolitical prepper uh, expert par excellence. So he knows what the, where this is all going geostrategically. Well, we know that the Ebola that is in the west side of uh, Africa is not the same as the Zaire Ebola. It's a different virus altogether. And Tell us the fact, difference. It looks what, like, the, it, it looks like it's been weaponized. It looks like right, it's been it, weaponized to increase the incubation time, and that allows right. people to travel. And, in fact, we think that about 40 people uh, escaped from West Africa, went into uh, Italy, were smuggled into Italy, and then quarantined there uh, because of the thought that they might have Ebola. And, by also, the way, they turned out too positive. They did show positive. Some of them have already devolved and have active Ebola uh, right now. So that's in Pisa, Italy. <clears throat> so what we're dealing with is... That Ebola plague, by the way, and I know I've talked to my bioweapon friends inside the government because <clears throat> we did Operation Top Off in Dark Winter with the federal government. I was one of the point men under Reserve Admiral John Hughes in 1997. Uh, we did Operation Top Off in Dark Winter with the FBI and CDC uh, bioterrorism experts. First hand, this is not second hand. And uh, this Ebola plague it has three things that are unique about it. Number one, it went from a six to eight day incubation to a 21 to 28 day. Number two, it has massive viral uh, release that occurs for a long period of time before it turns into, into illness, which would occur really quickly before and causes a massive disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. So you can have a carrier state where you're not sick and shedding tremendous amounts of virus before it turns and kills you. That's the second thing. And the third thing about this virus is it, it lends to the possibility that could, there could be other associated viruses that it can recombine with because it lasts long enough. It, it doesn't just stay parochially in Africa. It could combine with other viruses. The first one discovered was named after a district in Germany called Marburg, uh, the town of Marburg, where the lab actually tested it. But there's other distantly related viruses that can, could combine and cause future plagues. So uh, then we have the beta coronavirus is now spread to Malaysia, <clears throat> to uh, Philippines, uh, two hot spots in Europe, Germany, and uh, where's Greece. the other spot? And Greece. Uh, yeah. And we got eight, seven, and nine. They've, they've exported two cases yeah. into Egypt. Two cases in Egypt. Twenty-six more cases in Saudi Arabia just reported today. Uh, and the H7 and 9 is spreading all over China, and the Chinese are doing nothing. They're terrified to no to notify people that these viruses are there because their economy will go into full cardiac blue arrest. If they notify people that they're exporting H7 and 9 to the local countries, Thailand and, and Vietnam, etc., their economy will go bye-bye. It'll be over instantly. They, when they shut down airline travel, which they did an experiment a few days ago with a virus, remember they did that in Los Angeles uh, uh, export right, right. LAX? This is a test because when the virus goes, nobody is flying anywhere. Nobody. Where you That's are coming. Is where you'll stay. You're going to stay wherever your carcass is. Welcome back, and uh, we have reports from Ann and John to uh, complete this uh, hour, very high intensity hour. And I want you to talk about the last couple issues, and John, you've got some new reports as well. Yeah, I just wanted to mention there's been an increased risk of rabies in the Northeast, and I don't know if that's been introduced uh, deliberately or not. North, North, but, uh, Northeast United States, right? In these United States. And the other thing is that they've discovered a brand new pox virus, like a smallpox virus. And uh -huh. if, uh, people don't have any immunity to that. They stopped inoculating people for smallpox back in 1980. Uh, well, well, first off, the problem is if you're going to create a, a vaccine, it should create a, a bio uh, a fingerprint identical in antibody response and cellular immune response that actually prevents a pathogenic primary infection or takes a, an infection present and makes it go away. And uh, they never proved that with any vaccine for any human or animal. And so uh, I don't believe that they've removed any disease by using vaccines. And the fact is that these emerging viruses aren't just because of increased travel. It's because there are labs in virtually every country on Earth, the poor man's nuke, making these weapons. Okay, so it's really dangerous, it's really crazy, but it's really happening. Some of the labs are actually just being sloppy because they're quote, trying to make vaccines. Like there was a lab in Central and Eastern Europe, and they were actually having such sloppy procedures that they created recombinants by mistake. That's scary. That's scary. And I got the actual documents we released them about five years ago, and people say, no, 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 that's not true. And I said, here's all the documents. 
in these labs they got in all kinds of trouble with the European Commission that actually investigated them. Um, uh, John, you have a couple of reports as well. Yes, uh, Gordon Duff with Veterans Today. Uh, he has uh, he's been reporting some good reports for quite a while. He's reporting that uh, one ton of highly enriched uranium left Pakistan uh, for England, stayed in England for some short period of time, and uh, apparently have left both Heathrow and Gateway airports. Uh, uh, and may be headed to the United States. We're not yeah, uh, under what uh, sure uh, under what auspices is it the uh, a government exchange between the was there a standing Pakistani plant? Well, apparently why, why would it? Well, I, I, it, I don't know how Gordon got his inf- his hands on this information, but if, yeah. uh, apparently the, this uh, warehouse in uh, Devon, England, has previously been used to store illegal weapons by right, various right. intelligence <laughs> agencies. Yeah, let me explain what so surveillance happens to nuclear weapons in North America. And I know this because I work, as I say, with classified clearance. Every city, every town on Earth is monitored from space using what's called plasma interferometry from space, called scalar interferometry. They can map down to literally half a mile underground exactly what isotopes are present, whether it's wood, or concrete, or steel, or nuclear materials. Uh, and then they, when they see hotspots, they actually fly every week over every U.S., Canadian, Australian, city, whatever. They fly helicopters or jets over with radiation detectors to scan. If they find a hotspot, they actually send a special SWAT team in there to go in and, and figure out what the hell's going on. So that there's no way that anything could be transported to a port of entry, even Freeport, Bahamas, uh, ports in Texas or Via Cardenas in, in Mexico, with a material like this is in converse to so-called Janet Napolitano, the moron, who tried to tell us the lie that they only open two percent of containers. They can see these things from space. They could easily pop the container seals. They'd easily be able to find out if there's not just a suitcase nuke but a container size nuke. And so, if these kind of materials are coming in, it's because they want them to come in. Right. Okay. Right. Well, Just like they, 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 when people say, well, it looks like the Saudis were involved with 9-11, and so were, by the way, the Israelis, but they were just the thumb of the hand of the CIA and the NSA. So we want to blame the Israelis or the Saudis. We have to blame our own secret agencies that get a lot of political capital for the New World Order and a lot of laws passed, like the National Defense Authorization Act, etc., the John Warner Defense Act, etc., 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 Patriot Act 1 and 2, uh, all kinds of other, quote, executive orders passed since Oklahoma City, Ruby Ridge 9-11. And the next maniac thing that happens, believe me, they'll lock this place t- t- down tighter than... than uh, It'll be a dystopic nightmare, let's put it that way. If there's ever a nuke off in a U.S. city that kills a quarter million people, you will have to have authentication wherever you go. You won't be able to go to the bathroom unless you authenticate. You won't be able to get on a bus unless you authenticate. You will have no money in the bank unless you authenticate. And if you piss off the authorities, they will press Alt-Delete and you'll exist no longer in cyberspace. Well, uh, that would be... uh pretty devastating to most people these days. Well, they don't believe it. They think we're lying. They think that we're nuts. They think we're just doing this to entertainment. No, we're not. Because if we stop it now, if we catch it as nidus and tell everybody, including the people inside these agencies, and there's whistleblowers, people say, hey, I don't want that. There's rich and powerful and greedy people that don't want that. Only people that are hell-bent on the destruction of the human race and our planet want that. Absolutely. Well, there's another report out of Ukraine. I don't know if Tim covered this or not, but two uh, Ukrainian helicopters being shot down by surface-to-air missiles. Yes, uh, yeah, and uh, well, those were those were Ukrainian helicopters shot down right. by Russian pro-Russian right. Uh, patriots, right? So, yeah, the, the, so obviously the Ukrainian military is getting smacked, and of course, if the Russian moves across the border, if Kiev does anything like threaten the pipelines or starts to like a, a what is it now, Slavinovsk, the a city that they're surrounding, and some other cities. Right. Right. Uh, as they start taking a body count and Russian citizens or Russian-speaking people start getting killed, uh, Mr. Putin has no choice. He's right. going to sweep across there like a Viking raid, and they will slash and burn and crush them like a bug. They have yeah, no idea how fast and efficient they'll do it. Most people that are analyzing this, doctor, are reaching the same conclusion that you are, that when Russian-speaking people are being uh, murdered, that Putin will act. Yeah, and that's going to happen before the end of May. My prediction is this will force the hand of Europe uh, because if they don't deal with this, the first thing that's going to happen is Europe will crash and we'll have a complete cardiac arrest blue code of the world economy. 
and we will then be literally on the status of DEFCON 3 going to DEFCON 4 for an intercoming, inter intercontinental exchange of nuclear, biological, and scalar weapons. And all hell will break loose if they don't stop this. Absolutely. Well, it needs to be stopped. Uh, we need to uh, bring peace to the region, but I'm not sure that can be done. Well, here's what I think is probably going to happen, although I can't guarantee it. I think that the Russia will uh, try to act diplomatic through all this mess, even if Russian citizens are killed. They'll swoop in and neutralize these maniacs. They'll then try to stand by and get international United Nations and other peacekeepers to literally watch the elections, and they'll see that eventually Ukraine will be broken up into sub-republics, and most of them will go Russian. The, uh, they'll embarrass the heck out of the so-called pikers, uh, John Kerry and Obama, and the idiots like Rasmussen from NATO, and the Europeans will do nothing other than they say they're going to do the next thing to ruin the shopping day of Russian oligarchs, of their wives. Ruining their shopping day is not going to fix geopolitics on a global scale. This is just irritating the dragon of Russia and pissing them off, and we should try to collaborate with them on stopping the drug trade, etc. And I think this is a prelude to an ultimate peace treaty, because if they don't solve Syria, most people don't realize the hottest spot, even if it isn't Iran, it's Syria, they are literally like six miles from the Israeli border. If they nuke Damascus, the radiation will destroy most of northern Israel. They'll be all dead. They just have to drop a nuke on it. Most of Israel will be so radioactive, you won't be able to grow anything there. Uh, so I think Syria is a real big issue, and if they don't solve the Syrian issue and they keep on trying to do regime change, not only will they have Iran sending drones, because they're serious, they got some big bad drones. They got the Shahid missile, they have, all they need is dirty bombs. They don't even need to have nukes. They just have conventional weapons with cobalt-60, and they can make Israel a devastating nuclear wasteland. So, uh, you know, uh, the Europeans and these other people just don't understand the multi-level of asymmetric warfare. Uh, can you talk about that, John, because you're an expert on warfare. Asymmetric warfare in the 21st century with multiple allies right up to the big level 10 guys like Russia is really damn stupid for us to start. Well, asymmetric warfare is warfare from multiple methods all at the same time. Right. Uh, Seventy something years ago we had uh, the Japanese fleet crossing the Pacific. Uh, that, that's that, that, that passe, that's gone. Right. Uh, not that they won't use aircraft carriers and so forth, but in addition there'll be cyber warfare, there'll be biological warfare, uh, there'll be economic warfare, uh, uh, cultural warfare, which has been going on for decades by the way, um, psychological warfare, all taking place at the same time, and right. you, you'll you'll feel like you're in a boxing ring being attacked by two boxers and hit by uh, four uh, gloves <laughs> in different parts of your body all at the same time. Uh, right. In other words, you you literally will be twisting and writhing airborne, being hit at the same time by different boxers striking right. different body parts or maintaining you so you're no longer touching the mat. And you can't you can't recover from one hit before the next one's getting it. Yeah. And, and I, I can tell people we need to, number one, pray against this evil. We need to also pray for the repentance of the state of Israel and America. And now with this bisexual, as they said, head of the focus on the family, abortion president. And he's now trying to abort America and our planet. We need to stop this guy and, and repeal Obamacare. We need to impeach him. We need to stop Lurch, uh, a.k.a. Mr. Kerry, John Kerry. He should go back to being a s second in a new Adams Family movie, but he shouldn't be the Secretary of State. He's crazy. Thank you, Doctor. It's celebrity. Thank you, John and Ann. Amazing update. Keep tuned.